Welcome back, NAFA. 1988, I walked the streets door to door, selling $5,000 and $10,000 face amount policies. It was just a few months into my career that I had to deliver my first death claim check to a mother who lost her son in a drive-by shooting. Her son was seven years of age. When I delivered that check, we laughed, we cried, we reminisced. But then she said something to me that changed my life forever. She said, Shane, because of this $10,000 check, I can keep my dignity. You see, because of this $10,000 check, I don't have to ask my family, my friends, or my church for the money that I need to give my son the decency he deserves. That's what we do. We provide dignity when it matters most, when it is expected and when it is unexpected. So remember, as financial professionals, we bring dignity. At Gateway Insurance and Gateway Financial Services, we're proud members and proud sponsors of NAFA because without NAFA, I would not be a success. So thank you, NAFA, for being my family, my friends, my mentors, and my colleagues. It is my pleasure now to introduce our next guest. First, I would like to introduce Connor <clears throat> O'Brien. Mr. Connor O'Brien is the CEO and president of O'Shares ETFs. He has over 25 years of experience in the financial markets, including 15 years in New York at Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch, followed by investment management across range of equity and fixed income strategies, building a mutual fund business, and more recently, leading successful development and growth of O'Shares ETFs. Mr. O'Brien is a graduate of Dartmouth College, where he received his MBA, and Middlebury College, where he received his BA in physics and economics. I also know that Mr. O'Brien is an Olympic skier. Mr. O'Brien, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. In addition, many of us know him as the ABC Shark Tank and CNBC as an investor who, dem who demands quality, performance, and limited risk. He was the founder of SoftKey Software, products of the learning company, and many other venture capital investments. He is an entrepreneur, he is a business leader, and I also know that Mr. Kevin O'Leary is a Patriots fan. Kevin, welcome. With that. You're on, you're on mute, Kevin. <laughs> Is that better? That, that's better, thank you, sir. With that, I'm gonna turn it over, Connor, to you and let you take it away for this session. Fantastic, I see on the screen someone saying, go Pats. We hope <laughs> all of them are back at the game pretty soon. So, uh, just a quick uh, thank you first to Shane and Gateway Financial and to NAIFA or NAFA and all the advisors that are with us on today's call. We hope it's extremely informative. You know, our goal is to share with you some stories, some information, and really some optimism uh, as you lead your clients through what is likely um, a stressful period for their financial lives and, and more. And I think for each of you on this call, they see you as their quarterback to stick with the Pats analogy. You are their quarterback, whether you like Tom Brady or somebody else, they rely on you to take care of their financial well-being. So um, we wish you all the success with that and we hope we can be part of helping you with that. I think what you're gonna to learn today from, from us about OSHA's ETFs and about Kevin O'Leary as, as an investor is he, he's conservative, we are conservative, Capital preservation is extremely important, and build, generating and building income is extremely important to the way we run ETFs, or way, the way we construct them. Uh, the indexes determine the portfolio, but these are indexes designed to give people an added measure of capital protection, income, and income growth. Before we get to the ETFs, uh, Kevin certainly has some stories that are going to be of interest to you that relate to what we're all living through right now. Kevin, we've talked to some other people about some of these topics and uh, your reasons for optimism. Let's just first briefly touch on the health situation. What makes you optimistic about the economy and the markets and the financial well-being of all investors who own equities and ETFs and equities? 
as everything works through a crappy period for the economy and jobs and earnings um, to emerge on the other side. Let's talk about the health and the optimism you have for the economy. Yeah, I, I'm, um, you know, I'm an observer like everybody else regarding this pandemic, but uh, I would say a few things. You gotta remember, and, and you know, it partly explains uh, the market's optimism, I think. 11 years ago, SARS uh, was an epidemic and um, uh, it, was a, it was a difficult one. It caused a lot of grief as well. Not as much economic turmoil, but certainly loss of life. But since then, since the, the 11 years, uh, there's probably been a five-fold increase in, in biotechnology, I call it, in the ability to use uh, artificial intelligence and other elements of science to advance um, therapeutic research and, of course, uh, this, the seeking of a vaccine. And so I, I think, you know, globally, there's a lot of optimism that either therapeutic or combination of therapeutic or vaccine is probably within 18 months away. And the market is certainly um, looking in that direction. And obviously there's a lot of volatility as the news comes out. Moderna was the first, but there's 98 others uh, in, in process with some very large firms. And you're, this is well known in the market. But um, I have a different view about, um, you know, how this is being played out in volatility. And it, it's come to my, the most correlated index I can use for the health aspect is what I call the Cuomo index out of New York. As you know, he very often will do a, a, a press conference between 12 noon and three. Um, and as his optimism or lack thereof occurs, so go the world indexes because New York has become the ground zero for this pandemic. Uh, it's really a, a giant cruise ship that's motionless, extremely uh, dense, you know, six million people packed in 75 floor, uh, floor buildings. I mean, until that's resolved, there'll still be volatility of the news coming out of New York, but it, it tends to trend better almost every week. And at some point, um, it'll have to get resolved, but there are going to be some big shifts in asset classes as a result of this. And I'll make some observations about that. You know, I want to go back to just a few Fridays ago, it's probably two months ago, maybe nine weeks ago now, when the first PPP program was announced on a Friday, it got signed in the house at 245. Uh, many of us had the bill in front of us, you know, half an hour later with our accountants and lawyers, and I certainly was one of those too. And um, prior to that bill, the, uh, and, and given that was a, a very bleak time, obviously we were shutting down retail left and right and grinding the economy to a halt by force. Um, most of the business, I have, I have an investment portfolio of 51 plus private companies in almost every sector, in almost every state. And so, and I, and I monitor their sales and cash flow on a weekly basis on the ones I have control over. So I'm, I have a pretty good snapshot of what's happening in consumer goods and services in America. And a lot of these companies obviously use retail. So the strategy for most CEOs at that time before reading the bill was, we're gonna make two offers to our employee base. We're either gonna furlough 50% of them, or we're going to ask the entire employee base to take a cut of 50% in salary to try and sustain the DNA of, of the business uh, during the, the troubled times, however long they're gonna be. As you know, the bill contemplates a period between Feb 15th and, and June 30. And there's a lot of other attributes to the bill, but I'm just gonna to cut to the chase in terms of how it changed secular uh, issues around investing. So then you read the bill. Um, by the way, most uh, small businesses under half a billion in sales took the second offer where everybody took a 50% haircut, kept their medical and everything else and their benefits and just you know would wait out how long it was gonna be until they got called back. Most employees were comfortable staying within the organization, even though it was a fifty percent haircut in, in salary. Then you read the bill, and it's clear what the bill's trying to do. It says we're going to take a snapshot of your portfolio on on Feb fifteenth, and we're going to look at the portfolio of payroll uh, on June thirty. And if those numbers are the same, or the June thirty numbers larger, uh, you you potentially or very high likelihood the loan is forgiven. So here's what happens, and I would call this an unintended consequence for sure. Um, everybody stops right there over the weekend and says, wait a minute, whole new deal. We're not firing anybody. Even a restaurant, you have to use 75%. Even though a restaurant's closed, has no revenue, it has to do 75% of the PPP towards employees during the period, which sounds a little crazy, but I, I can understand the metric of, of trying to keep these people 
um, in the DNA of a business. That was the intent of the government here in the bill. But here's what happens. You know you're not going to get the money for five to eight weeks. So the first thing you do is you have the same cost of business with no revenue, and you need to find cash to pay everybody. Otherwise, you're breaching the covenants of the potentially great deal you're being offered in the bill. So what happens? Over that weekend, millions of phone calls occur from small businesses to their landlords. And basically, the message is the same. Look, I'm going to have to defer um, rent for 90 days. And the negotiations were straight out, I'm not going to pay you to tack it on the end of my lease and, and something in between as well. Most of the private landlords at that time understood what was being uh, explained to them, particularly if the tenant had been great for a decade or whatever and was asking for a 90-day furlough or deferral. But the REITs, um, of which there are many, and uh, I can tell you I've had many interesting conversations with REITs headquartered or at least with their assets in New York State, Florida, Texas, and California, where I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations. Um, that was not a, an easy conversation because it was that weekend that they were starting to understand what was happening to them. And um, it's just gotten worse because I'll tell you what the, what the, the good news, and well, for me, it's the good news and the good news. Snap forward three months, basically. All of these businesses, even though they didn't want to and never would have taken this risk, were forced to operate remotely every single one of them, in every sector, large and small alike, not just my portfolio, I'm talking about every business, and you're well aware of that. And here's what we've discovered. Some of these businesses that I'm an investor in have had the best quarter they've ever had because they're involved in things like sanitation products or office supply for home office or uh, gyms made specifically for condos or, or office furniture, whatever. It just we're up 400%, 500%. We had, we had extraordinary quarters going on here. And that's step one. But here we are, you know, talking every week and we're doing this without any office space or any retail space. So this is what I think is going to happen. In just in my 50 companies, we think we can reduce our need for commercial office by about 20 to 25 percent and drive an additional 7 percent free cash flow into the portfolio. And when the average business is making 15 percent pre tax, 7 percent is huge. So, one of the reasons the market is, is so buoyant, in my opinion, is that there, we're going to emerge from this as America 2.0 with some tremendous efficiencies driven by technology and the ability to use it to become more efficient and cut costs. So th that's one element to it, except if you're long commercial real estate or you're in a AAA office tower, 75 stories high, and you face hundreds of millions of dollars of capital expenditure to modify the elevators to be whatever they're going to be, because they're not going to be elevators with 80 people in them anymore, or the, the, the washroom stack has to be changed, or the protocol of how many square feet per person, or all that stuff, uh, is going to have to be contemplated. In addition to that, a REIT is a long duration asset, very much like a utility. And now I'm speaking as you know, an investor, to those of you that are concerned about these things, when you helicopter, let's call it $4 trillion, onto the economy, which is probably what the number is going to be, if not five, by the time this is over, you would, you would have a higher risk of inflation a couple of years out than you had before you did that. There's no question. So if you're going to buy long duration assets, including real estate and, and utilities and government bonds for that matter, you're taking huge risk. And I, I think there's a tendency now for people to say, well, not only am I going to get the efficiency of potentially 7% free cash flow by just saying goodbye to all that space I don't need, and um, I, want to, I want to invest in things that have pricing power, companies that, that are actually a little bit of inflation is actually a very tasty item in an economy if you own a great company that has pricing power. Uh, you've, got, you've got growth, you've got pricing power, you can expand margins sometimes. It's a very interesting time. So I think the old adage of 
50-50, fixed income, 50 equity. I, I'm, not, I'm not signing up for that anymore. I, that used to be my portfolio. I'm moving to 70% equities now. I, I've sold all my government bonds. I've taken my real estate exposure from over 30% down to eight. And um, that, that's quite a big change for me. I mean, that really, it, it's an asset I've owned for decades and it's served me very well, both in capital appreciation but I would argue right now, if you have prime office, New York or Boston, and you, and you got in at a four and a half cap or something, I bet you that thing's a six cap in within 12 months. I mean, easily, because you got tenants that don't want all the space anymore, and you've got to find new tenants. And secondly, you got a hell of a lot of CapEx you weren't planning for. I don't care what office tower it is, or maybe you have to turn it into a condo, I don't know. But the point is, this is going to make America more efficient, and a really interesting place to invest, I think. And the market smells that out, senses it out. And all we have to do is wait for the therapeutic or the vaccine or the herd inoculation. And I think we're going to come out of this in, in pretty good shape with some sectoral shifts in asset allocation. So if you're long real estate, I don't know what to tell you. Um, it's gonna be difficult, but everything else looks pretty good to me. So on the real estate side, I think everyone does understand retail is essentially in shutdown mode. Restaurants are in shutdown mode. Some of these people are using money to try and stay alive, keep their businesses going. For sure, there's going to be transformation. I think that one source of optimism, Kevin, you touched on is how the U.S. economy had and this historically also been a case, transforms itself, just adapts. And these catalysts for change are really, really, really helpful. And I know you want to get to the e-commerce theme and the 50 companies you have that have made a pivot adapting. But I wanted you to touch on a, another sector before you go there. You, know, you talked about where you're going to take money away from. You're taking money away from fixed income. Okay. You're shifting from 50-50, taking 20 points of fixed income and going 70% equities. So that's one item you've told people. And getting away from REITs is another place you're taking money away from. Where are you going to put the money? Where's it going to go to? Talk about healthcare. Talk about your source of income. I know it's dividends, but you can talk first about the, the healthcare sector. And then second about how you go from safe bonds to let's call it safe-ish equities. And then put your shoes in the, your, your, your feet in the shoes of, of Tom Brady or the quarterback of uh, a lot of families' financial well-being share your advice with the advisors that are on the call today, of how you address that with clients. You're going to basically be taking money away from bonds that have served them so well and fixed income funds that have served them so well, moving away from it now. So the first thing, talk about healthcare, talk about then that conversation with clients. Yeah, I, I would, you know, to advisors, um, and I work with uh, plenty of, of advisors, particularly in the fixed income and convert, preference space um, where you really need uh, vertical expertise. I don't try and do that myself, but I, I certainly work with lots of advisors. And I would, I would say to any advisor listening here, the, the number one mandate, um, as far as I'm concerned, and I, and I would you know, say that anybody over 50 years old probably uh, feels this way as well. It's not about performance. I, I don't expect, I don't hire advisors for performance. I hire advisors for preservation of wealth to force diversification. Um, I, I'm going to get market returns, whether I'm a couple of hundred basis points in any direction, I don't really care. Um, I'm going to pay the fees based on the amount of assets that, that I don't care about fees because I'm going to get market rates based on you know, how much I put into any one mandate. What I really care about is preservation. And so if, if, I, were, if I were a uh, an advisor today, um, with all this volatility, and, and, and I understand that the job gets a little tougher when there's volatility, there's two things I, I would be thinking about. Number one is, you know, if you've been doing it long enough, and I've been doing it long enough, you realize that when you have a drawdown like we had on, on this, this one, I mean, this, every drawdown has a different personality, 08 or 9-11 or whatever. This one was unprecedented in the speed of which we gave up over 30%. It was a matter of 12 or 13 trading sessions. It was extraordinary. And that's volatility, particularly when you haven't had any for a few years. And then you get it. Well, what you have to realize, and the job is to explain, and you can go back in any drawdown and look back, 
in the retracement back up, whether it takes two years or it takes a year, or in this case, a few months, the majority of the returns come in a handful of days. In this case, it was also extraordinary on the way up. There were 11% days. There were 13% trading sessions across two sessions. You know, there were 8% days. If you're not participating in a day where you're going up 8%, you will never get that back. And so trying to time the market when it's volatile is a huge mistake, which many people generally do once and they realize how much they left on the table trying to do it and they never do it again. So it's, it's better, I think, as an advisor to simply say, look, it's going to be very volatile now because the news is going to dictate the direction of the market. But because we don't know which days all the returns are going to come in, and certainly the, on the 34% retracement back up, I've never seen so few days give so much, so much of the return. It's just been amazing. And, you know, from my point of view here, I'm sitting in quarantine on Miami Beach and some days I just go out with a glass of Chardonnay on the balcony and just look at the ocean and I'd, I'd be down millions and millions of dollars. And then the next day I go out with a Cabernet Sauvignon and I'm up millions and millions of dollars. And that's what you have to live with. And I think you know that. But it's the asset allocation on the preservation side that I'd speak to now. Bonds have been a phenomenal investment for decades. They have saved my hiney for so long, it's incredible. On the most volatile times, good old government bonds that used to, when I started buying them, yield 6.5% are now 68 bips or something, you know, for, for a, I mean, I mean, you're talking about a 10 year that is virtually worthless in terms of yield and yet has huge duration risk to it. And it's very hard to explain to a client, well, look, you know, I know we used to be 50% bonds, but if we buy these bonds and inflation comes back in the next couple of years, we're going to lose 20 or 30% face value. And, you're, and because you're 66 years old, you'll be dead by the time these bonds come due and mature. I mean, it's, it's sort of a tough conversation, but the options are cash, which will have no return, or finding a company with a great balance sheet that's spinning uh, you know, right now the S&P, you can tiptoe through the S&P and find companies at 2.7 to 3.2% div yield. And if you're bogey 6%, that's half the bogey right there. Most sovereign institutions, I, I did some work yesterday with the, the World Government uh, Conference and had a chance to talk uh, with some of the, the sovereign wealth funds. Their bogey for next year is 6%. That's, you know, and, and uh, CalPERS went on the record and that CEO, she said hers was seven. Well, where are you going to get that? You're not going to get it in government bonds. And every million you put into government bonds sets you up where you have to find another five and a half percent somewhere else. And so that is why you're seeing such a huge, you know, support for high quality equities. Now, I use an index that I, uh, and I'm sure Connor's going to reference it as well, was involved in designing. It doesn't, I don't want to own all the S&P because I, I don't like, uh, companies that have low return on assets. That's an old school measure, um, that one that I grew up with that I like a lot. And if, if the company is, is, um, has, a, has a really poor return on assets, and that's pretty well all the banks these days, I don't want to own them. I want to own companies who are decreasing their uh, debt and increasing their free cash flow and therefore usually increasing their dividends. And I like to ride those out in, every, in pretty well every sector. I mean, I, I don't, I'm kind of sector agnostic. You know, last year energy was out of favor. And now you've got market calls saying energy could lead the way. And who the hell knows is my point. But if you give me the best balance sheet in energy, it's probably an Exxon or a Chevron right now, which I happen to own. And, you know, those things are yielding. I, I don't know if it's 6 or 8%. I haven't looked in the last few weeks. I haven't looked at the prices. But those are the kind of things I'm going to sit back with and own while I think, well, recovers back in the mid-40s at some point. But who knows when. But my point is those balance sheets are pretty rock solid. And probably the beneficiary of all of the problems that are going to happen in the, the shale with all this, you know, single C debt, all those guys are going to go bankrupt and all those assets are going to flow to the big guys. And that's kind of why you want, in, in my case, OUSA is the index I'm talking about. It's about 130 names out of the S&P 500 that to me are the best quality names. And, you know, basically all I'm, all I'm looking for is protection on the drawdown. And I, and I also want 6%. I distribute 6% to my charities and all the stuff I need to have money for. So I basically am looking for a way to make 6% a year. And I don't care if I beat the market. I don't care what the fees are because I'm going to get the best deal anyway. So it doesn't matter to me. But protection on the downside, 
That's what I care about. And that's what most of your clients care about too. So that's number one. The asset classes I like now, overweighting healthcare for two reasons. We are undoubtedly going to return the supply chain for pharmaceuticals back to North America. I include Mexico and Canada in that because right now the Canadian dollar is, is practically worthless. So it's a great place to go put up manufacturing and pharmaceuticals, highly trained workforce, a friendly place to do business and a huge cost savings, almost equivalent to doing it in Vietnam or something. And so um, I think it's going to be the beneficiary of a lot of that returning of the supply chain for hazmat, you know, even, even masks and all the things that we let be done in Asia are, are all coming home. And by the way, that is an inflationary trend. You're not going to get the lowest cost. It's not just in time inventory anymore. It's just in case inventory. We never want to be in a situation where we can't, I mean, the Swiss population right now, everybody can get a test every morning if they want. So if you're a taxi driver in Switzerland, you get tested every morning. I can't do that here in Miami. Why not? So we, we don't want to have that happen again uh, to, to, to America. So we're going to change all that. And I think there won't be a single politician bashing a pharmaceutical or healthcare or biotech company in this election while they're saving our lives using all this technology to find a vaccine and therapeutics. So I think we're safe from the Hillary Clinton type bashing or the Bernie stuff. That's not going to happen. And I think that sector's PE is going to increase as a result of that. And when a vaccine is finally found, thank goodness we have a pharma and a, a biotech and all the science that we, you know, it's IP here because it's clearly uh, going to be an issue. Uh, as we all know, the G20 is going to happen in November, this time in Riyadh. And the agenda was going to be climate change and entrepreneurship. Uh, that's out the window. Uh, the, the top agenda item I learned yesterday is going to be what's called pandemic avoidance protocol, a negotiation amongst the G20 about what has to happen when you identify a virus attack or the first you know, issuance of a virus transferring from animal to human. If we had shut down uh, China within 48 hours of that virus being discovered, uh, we, we would not have the problems we have now. And that's going to be the focus of what I think the G G20 is going to talk about. So Kevin, give me a second here. I'm just going to recap a couple of what's called game plan takeaways that you've talked about. I'm just going to give a very quick synopsis of what our ETFs are, the ones that you've also mentioned. And then I'm going to ask you to talk about um, the theme of this call. One element of it is leadership. And you have 50 CEOs providing leadership to their companies and they're probably changing their game plan because of what we're living through. So think about that for a second while I just give people a recap of some of the takeaways that they may want to use in their game plan with their clients. So shifting away from fixed income, more to equities, sticking with high quality for income generating equities, companies that have strong dividends and an ability to continue paying them. And I will point out that dividends do tend to grow historically at a rate of about 10% if you look at the broad market of large caps and if you look at the stocks in OUSA. Also, dividend coverage, an extremely important metric to determine safety of or quality of your dividends. And it's one of the important measures of a stock for it to actually be included in a portfolio like OUSA. So those are some of the takeaways from, from Kevin's comments from a sector point of view. Less money in real estate, low to none. Uh, he took it from 30 to 8. More money in healthcare. OUSA does have a fairly healthy allocation to healthcare. And the themes are really just repatriation of more the supply chain, as well as getting the government policy uh, pressure away from pricing. So these are fundamental reasons healthcare probably performs better going forward. So OUSA is large cap quality dividend. It's only about 130, 140 stocks, not 500 stocks. The stocks that are in there score very well for profitability using ROA, strong balance sheets using cash flow to debt, urge you to take a look at it. It performs extremely well compared to just about every dividend Ooh. strategy we've analyzed when, when asked. And I will mention you can use o -share, info at oshares.com if you'd like to ask us for analysis of that type. And it'll be handled by our Director of Capital Markets, Kevin Beatles, and others on our investment team. OUSA, you may see the ticker above my head there. So OUSA is a uh, top Left, OUSM right above me is for small and mid caps, same strategy, high quality stocks, not 2000 stocks, but just over 200. And it's the ones that are gems. They have great profitability, strong cash flow to debt and those other metrics. 
So that's a little bit of the, some of the building blocks for a game plan. And I think as leaders of your client's wealth, having a game plan is probably something that they would appreciate hearing from you. So whatever your message, borrow from ours if you like, build it into yours and give them a game plan. I think their confidence level uh, will, will definitely improve. So Kevin, you've got 50 quarterbacks. They're not all Tom Brady, but you've got 50 businesses in which you have an ownership stake, an important stake. Each one has a CEO, call it the quarterback of the business. The theme of today's call with all the NIFA advisors is leadership. What have you noticed across those 50 CEOs, the top ones, the top 10 of the 50, what has been their change in leadership style over the past two, three months? Well, you know, I have some good um, case studies that, uh, you know, let's take a typical consumer good company. Let's say it's doing 50 million in sales a year. That's a typical small business growing quickly. 50% uh, of its sales would be coming through retail, 40% through Amazon, 10% direct on their website to their customers. That is, you know, that's the footprint of a million businesses in the United States today. That's sort of um, going into the pandemic. And then all of a sudden, 50% uh, of your revenue goes away in a 48-hour period when every single retailer in, in America, with the exception of grocery, shuts down or farming. And so you, that, that's a, Great leadership is about pivot. It's about figuring out, okay, um, didn't see that coming, but here's, here's what I'm going to do about it. Um, I'll give you an example of one that uh, I like to talk about because you would think this would have been on the list of a company that I thought could, could really be in stress. It's a company called Love Pop Greeting Cards. It's a very simple product, although it's very hard to make. This is a very complex three-dimensional uh, laser cut dragonfly card. Um, this is America's fastest growing greeting card company. Greeting cards were thought to have gone out the window with e-cards, not so. This is a very fast growing category as people like the idea of sending something physical. However, most of the purchases of cards like this are done on a spontaneous emotional basis in retail. So whether you're, um, you know, you're, you're, it's a birthday or a holiday or something, you see the card, you buy it. So we had retail uh, space in, in all over America, pretty well every major mall, including Hudson Yards, which by the way, you cannot pay more anywhere on earth. That is the most expensive real estate in the world. Uh, and justifiably so, it has remarkable uh, traffic when it was open, uh, particularly um, international traffic. So we did extraordinarily well in that location and paid a fortune for it. And then of course it goes away. And so you know, we're, and, and this is a time of year when a, a holiday like Mother's Day is huge. I mean, that, that could be 11, 12, 13% of the year right there on that one day. So what did the company do? And this is an example of great leadership. Knowing that all the florists had lost their distribution centers due to COVID, people weren't working in there and the flowers are rotting in these distribution centers. Price of a you know, bundle of flowers for Mother's Day was going through the roof. Um, they came up with a pivot. They said, okay, it's not greeting cards anymore. I'm going to make uh, three-dimensional bouquets of flowers out of the laser cutting facilities in Vietnam. That, that's what their supply chain is. They moved it out of China. These things were a huge hit, just a huge hit, millions of dollars in sales. Uh, they're beautiful. You don't have to water them. <laughs> they kind of look nice all the time. And by by, by selling them direct to the customer, margins went up 35%. Even though the company lost a huge portion of its retailers, it has had one of its best months ever in revenue and in free cash flow. That's an example of great leadership, a, a complete pivot, reorganizing um, the business in terms of being able to, in fact, these guys were so successful, they were able to offer some of the laser cutting capacity that they have to cut those um, face guards you see and they, they because New York was running out of them and they became a supplier uh, and, uh, overnight and shipped plane loads full of those to uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, the company's called Love Pop so I'm very proud of them. It's one of my larger holdings but it's, it's the whole point is it, here's the opportunity now. They had some really expensive real estate and here they are doing very very well. Uh, I'm not saying they're going to give up on retail but they're certainly going to reassess it. And 
on a marg on a marginal you know the incremental marginal basis i would say that we'll probably be cutting back on that because we'd rather just sell to uh, direct to our customer and, and, and which we're gonna do. So if you're a, a mall REIT uh, or you're an expensive office tower in Boston, I think it's, um, I'm, I'm looking to carve 7% of my uh, free cash flow out of you and I'm gonna get it. And so- Well, we're gonna see how the REITs pivot. Uh, that'll be interesting to, to look for and it'll probably take them years because real estate's a slow moving asset class. So I guess the takeaway that I, that I get from your, your various pivots you've seen in your companies. One is get the PPP as quickly as you can. Two, cut the rent. And three, find a way to e-commerce your business. I know we're tight on time here because Shane does want to get to us for Q&A. So I'm going to just, I'm going to cover one more thing about ETFs that many people do know. And then I'm going to ask you to talk briefly about OGIG. Uh, and so a lot of the advisors use mutual funds. They've been great. Uh, ETFs come into the picture. And what's a surprising huge benefit of ETFs is they're incredibly tax effective for the client. Instead of getting a tax bill every year from a mutual fund that took some gains somewhere, you don't get that with ETFs. Massive advantage. Yes, they're transparent. Yes, the fees might be lower and so on. But that tax advantage is huge. Now's an interesting time for people to pivot their strategy because this is a mutual fund that they loved and the had run way, way up, it's probably pulled back a bit and the tax hit of moving out of it to something more tax efficient might be more advantageous today than, than it used to be, let's call it a year or two years ago. So that's something about ETFs just really, really worth understanding if you don't actually already have that uh, locked down. Um, the second thing about our ETFs, OUSA, OUSM in particular, it's quality, it's dividends, and dividends do grow typically at about 10% a year. So it's a, it's a nice pivot to your, your portfolios for your clients, part of your action plan. So Kevin, I know Shane is ready with some Q&A to fire at you, but before he goes there, let's talk a minute about OGIG. It's the OShares Global Internet Giants. It is up year to date by about 25%, positive return, 25%. We built it because the technology sector had been essentially stripped of stocks that people wanted to own. The tech sector definition doesn't include Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix. Those got pushed into other sectors. So your companies use a lot of the 50 plus companies that are in OGIG. Just give people that one minute sound bite of what it is you really like about OGIG compared to the traditional tech sector. Old tech is what we call traditional tech. New tech is what you'll find in OGIG. Why do you like it? Because the, what, what's happened here, if you think about it uh, from just an acceleration point of view, pre-pandemic, the U.S. was online, represented 15.5% of, of overall retail ex-autos. Uh, autos is a strange element to, to online retail because you only buy a car every three to five years. So what happened over basically a three-month period is we've gone from 15.5 ex-autos to 24%, which was supposed to happen over seven years. It happened in 90 days. Because think about, you know, a grandmother sitting here in my building here in, in, uh, in South Beach has never used her cell phone to order groceries before. She didn't have a choice but to figure it out. And now she's doing it every day. And there's millions more like that that have now gone to e-commerce. Now, in order to do that, the companies that were working remotely had to buy a whole set of tools. So it wasn't just you know, Amazon that was the beneficiary of this. There were, although it's an important company to have in a portfolio like OGIG, but if you open, I, I suggest to everybody out there, because it's transparent, I like that about, we, we built this indice. You can go and look at every name in there and every one of them has been the beneficiary of driving companies to force them to work remotely, number one. Number two, service customers directly. So the Shopify's of the world, the DocuSigns, the Wix, all of these tools are licensed subscriptions. And these companies have had a Zoom, what we're, you know, we're doing right He's now. It's, it's another one that's in the portfolio. And people say, oh, as soon as the, the vaccine is found, uh, all these companies are gonna collapse. That is so not true. The genie's out of the bottle. It, th these companies are on a trajectory of growth north of 30% for, for the foreseeable future. Because if you can acquire a customer 
and I've seen this happen every day across all my companies, and have them buy from you directly in perpetuity, that's worth 35% more free cash than going through any other channel. And so any tool that can help you do that, you, you know, one of the reasons Facebook is hit new highs in the last few days is Facebook, I, I'll explain why it's so important and why that everybody said, oh, Facebook's not hip anymore, the kids have moved on. It has nothing to do with that. Facebook allows you to geolock. It allows you to actually be able to, to get a region. I'll give you an example of, um, of a company that, that used Facebook to save themselves a ton of money. Let's say you, you make, I have a company that makes in, in Oklahoma that mines limestone, some of the purest, best limestone in the world, adds citrus, citric acid to it and creates a completely safe, non-toxic insecticide that works better than anything you've ever seen. It's called First Saturday. And crazy name, but the idea is you sprinkle it around your home on the first Saturday every month and nothing comes in your house and it works. And you can eat it. It's incredible. It weighs 20 pounds a bag. The demand for it, it was one of my Shark Tank companies. It aired you know, a couple of months ago. The demand went crazy and we had tons of it in our warehouse in Oklahoma. Well, why even bother shipping it anywhere else? Why don't we just sell what we've got to everybody in Oklahoma? Because we have the demand outstripped us by five times. So we're able to geolock the Oklahoma region with Facebook, advertise to our customers there, hire our own trucks to ship the stuff, save a fortune, make a fortune, and we use Shopify, we use Wix to design it, we use, you know, uh, obviously Facebook. And now Facebook's done a partnership with Shopify to provide those services. So these are the engines that you need to own over the next five years. Even if you say to yourself, well, I'm buying Facebook at, at, at its high. It's not going to stop. It, it's going to yeah. keep going. And that's my whole point. And, and I think at the end of the day, all the companies inside the OGIG index are worth, open up OGIG, look at it. Some of the names you've never even heard of are growing 40% a year. That's absolutely right. There are actually over 50 companies in there. We looked at the sales growth they've reported for the first quarter. And quite interesting, almost every single one of them has reported positive sales growth this, so far this year. And the majority of them have had an earnings surprise, meaning positive earnings versus analyst estimates. So I know, Shane, you might have collected some questions from people, some of your own. Uh, I'm going to ask you in just a second to turn it to you and just remind people they can get information about us. Just go on the web, just type in info at oshares.com, send your questions. They'll be handled by our head of capital markets. And um, if there's a salesperson that covers your area, we'll make sure that we have that salesperson cover you or we'll provide it to you directly. So we're very, very appreciative of your time and attention on this. We are all about quality stocks when it comes to dividend paying stocks. So those companies, we believe, will be the ones that get through the recession better and will sustain and grow their dividends better. And it's Kevin's strategy for moving away from fixed income into quality dividend paying, dividend growing stocks. OGIG is the, e the ticker of the ETF that owns 50 plus large cap global e-commerce and internet services companies. Some you know, some are new companies that are already at 100 billion market cap that our system through the index method finds and includes early. Zoom has been in OGIG for about two years. Uh, most people only started to learn about Zoom in the last several months. So that just gives you a quick example on that. And OGIG is up about 25% year to date. So uh, it's, it's driven by the revenue growth. So that's enough story about our ETFs and the tickers are behind me. Shane, please uh, get yourself back on the screen here. Well, and, I'm, I'm um, gonna stay off camera. Uh, off, <laughs> we'll let you stay off camera then. And what we'll do here, if you have a handful of questions, Kevin's used yeah. to the lightning round on CNBC. They fire questions at him and give him 20 seconds to answer. So, um, why don't I just turn it over to you and I'll ask Kevin to take about 20 seconds per answer. Very good. We're coming up to about five minutes left in this segment. Uh, so Kevin, thank you again for uh, all that you've done and being part of the presentation. I will rapid fire a few questions at you. One question that has come in by multiple people, small businesses, um, they took the PPP loan, which uh, hypothetically is supposed to be used um, for payroll and a little bit for rent. The question is, would it be wiser to possibly take that money since it's a low interest rate, not worry about paying payroll, keep their businesses operational, and then just plan to pay it back in a loan format later. What was your opinion on that? Uh, in some cases, we did exactly that. You, you forgave the possibility of not uh, getting it forgiven. 
uh, but you're correct. If you didn't use 75% of it for payroll, and, and most of the companies that we did that with were food services where we weren't even allowed to be open. So what's the point? Um, it made no sense. So we knew when we got it that we were going to suffer the slings and arrows of having to pay it back, but that's better than going out of business. And so um, you're right. But if it wasn't food services, we stuck to the rules, which were 75%, because in many cases, we were able to, to, to re-employ the employees to do other things towards selling direct to customers, uh, you know, doing social media campaigns, working on fulfillment, logistics, all of that stuff. And I would say, even though, you know, there's been a lot of criticism here and there, those loans were very welcome and they worked. My bet is 80% uh, of the companies that took them are going to are going to survive and another 20 will fail. But that's not too bad given, um, you know, how horrific this downturn was in terms of retail. So I, I applaud the government in, in what they did there. Even the second round, the extra 251 billion. I might add that Facebook just announced another 40 million that they're distributing to a companies owned by women and minorities today. Good answer, we'll let, you, we'll let you go over 20 seconds there. One thing I noticed in Kevin's answer, by the way, is companies pivot their employees, not just the CEO, but actually some of the people on the team pivot to a slightly different role. Uh, Shane, back to you. Another quick one. Uh, yeah, another quick question is you had mentioned REITs a number of times, the 20% reduction. Do you see that as short-term or long-term, both uh, maybe retail and office space, or, or are they different? No, I, I think I, real, real estate is a great asset. I just think it's impaired now for the next three to five years. And so there's other places to put money to work. It's not that I hate real estate. I mean, I love real estate. I've owned it. It's been a core holding forever. But it, it's, it's, it's now facing some extraordinary uh, headwinds. And, and given all the other opportunities, why put yourself in a place that has duration, that's inflation risk, and every guy and his dog wants to cut costs in. And you have to spend hundreds of millions to turn. I, I listened to one of the guys today on CNBC explain that you're going to get in an elevator and, and sit in a tube that's going to go over you with another guy in a tube beside you as you go up to the 70th floor. I mean, that's crazy. No one's going to do that. So I, no matter how much you spend, because you don't know if the guy that was in the tube before you uh, was infected. I, I, think, I think they have, I mean, they're, 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 they're doing anything they can to, to talk their book, but it's a horrific situation. Probably better to turn that building into condos. So I have to ask, both of you are sports fans and uh, have that background. And I think we, uh, Kevin and uh, O'Connor, I think we asked this question on a conference call once before that I was on with you. Uh, a couple of people are asking sports uh, events, concert events, big events. Uh, your view, short term, long term, do you think they'll be coming back and uh, the outcome going there? Uh, I, I think that there won't be the traditional concert until there's herd inoculation. Um, I think there's going to be all kinds of digital models that people would, you know, if I, I, I happen to like Steely Dan, while, well, you know, Fagan is still playing. If you told me I had to pay, you know, the tickets for his concerts were up to 250 bucks. If I could see it live uh, digitally on my TV for 59, 60, 99, I'd pay it. So th those pay-per-view events are gonna replace it. I know Live Nation is all over that right now. I mean, I think it's, if you, if you wanna take a, a contrary view, that stock has been you know, pounded pretty hard, but they're probably the number one index in that space. They were doing three concerts a day globally before this shut, and now they've down to zero concerts. So they're gonna have to go to digital. But I, large sporting events and, and, and large crowds, I think we're 36 months away from that being fully restored and until we have, you know, at least a billion doses of the vaccine implemented. Yeah, I think we're going to see a gradual phase in. First is going to be uh, reluctant, but reality is going to drive this. Pro sports played in empty arenas and empty stadiums, maybe select super high price tickets for a few people. And then they're going to gradually go to very, very low density audiences that have been sanitized on the way in the door, out the door, touch nobody, keep give people their social distance, and then gradually evolve toward a scenario where it's called something more like, like we're used to uh, after there's herd immunity. And that could be 18, 24, 36 months. All right, we have one minute left, so this is gonna be a real rapid fire. Thank you, both of you. Um, you're both great leaders and CEOs. So quick uh, reply back to this question. I'll turn it back over to John. And that is, as CEOs, leaders of your companies, uh, Kevin, you see a lot of people on Shark Tank. What would be the word of advice for the people on attendance today? We have about 4,500 people attending that all own businesses, talk to other business owners. From a leadership perspective, what's uh, a good word of advice that both of you could leave us with? 
Well, I'm, I'll, be I'm, I'll be I'll be quick and I'll leave the rest of the time to Kevin. I would have a game plan that applies to your client and be the leader that gets out there and talks to them about their game plan. What is it that they're doing that's fine and what do they need to change? What do they need to pivot? Borrow some of Kevin's ideas, build in your own. That's my suggestion. Be their leader. I found out something extraordinary. We've reached out to a lot of our customers direct. And usually when we do a campaign like that, we get two, two and a half percent response. But by being honest with them saying, look, we're really struggling here. We're trying to provide you with the best customer service we can. We know you've bought our product or service from us before. Reaching out has got response rates of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 percent. You know, buy two, get one free, whatever it is. That's number like America's pulling together like it was a war because it is a war. So I would say that to, to, to CEOs and, and business leaders, speak to your customers without any bullshit at all. Just tell them the truth. That's what they want. Say the same to your employees. They want the truth also. You're, you're, so many people's tendency is to try to be optimistic at a time that's very difficult, not worth it. Just tell the truth. But by doing so, opening up that communication is really powerful. And look at the response rates we're getting on asking our customers to help us out during these periods. And, you know, and lastly, always remember, if you're the owner, you're last on the list. Customers first, employees second, and you're last. And that's the way it should be. Anyways, I really enjoyed today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Shane, John, all of you. Thank you, gentlemen. These are two men who know a lot about success and about leadership. But we're going to take another quick break right now and grab a snack or a beverage. Be sure you're back in 10 minutes for Hartford Chief Reginald Freeman.